Okay, I think we can we can start. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is the seventh uh, industrial development and policy lecture organized by the SOAS IDP research cluster, which is a research cluster hosted by the economics department, uh, which uh, involves quite a lot of people from three different departments in uh, SOAS, in particular from economics, development studies, and uh, partially also from uh, DEFIMS. Uh, all scholars involved in many ways uh, working on issues related to industrial development, transformation, policy, and so on. Um, many of you probably attended also the last uh, lecture by Maria Mazzuccato, and today we are extremely privileged to have uh, one of the uh, most well-known and uh, scholar who has been uh, doing seminal work in many of the areas that we have been covering in this uh, uh, lecture series, uh, Professor Rafi Kaplinski. Um, he has been a professor and now he's emeritus and honorary professor at Open University and IDS and more recently has rejoined SPRU at University of Sussex. Um, Rafi's work has been covering really the most important issues into the, in the areas of industrial development and policy, from uh, technology industry-specific studies, globalization, the impact of uh, organizational transformation on uh, global production networks and global value chain, his work from uh, his famous book from 2005, Globalization on Poverty and Inequality, has been one of the most well-known and referenced uh, uh, book contribution in this uh, literature. More recently, has been also looking at the impact that um, China and other big international drivers are having in the transformation of uh, global value chains and global production networks around the world. Um, what I always appreciated from uh, Rafi's work is uh, his extremely uh, powerful uh, analysis of production and technology. So remember, we met some time ago, two, three years ago, in Azerbaijan. At, at some point of, after our presentation, Rafi came to me and said, one time I was an economist, then I started visiting companies and became too late, it was too late to go back. And I remember that because in a sense capture this very strong emphasis on understanding micro level dynamics and being able to link that up to global uh, value chain and policy issues. I'm not taking more time, of course you know he's been involved in many projects and work with the UN organization, UNIDO, UNCTAD, and that has been working widely with uh, many governments, uh, in particular with the South African government over the last years. So today's uh, talk is quite a provocative talk uh, for a series which actually has been celebrating industrial policy, which says uh, end of industrial policy, if so, what then? So let me uh, leave the floor to Professor Kaplinski and uh, let me welcome him with a round of applause. Thank you, Antonio. It's a pleasure to be with you. Of course, I've had a long time association with SOAS. Uh, who could not? Uh, I know you want the answer to be 13 or 23 or 77. That is a very clear and specific answer. And I'm not going to give you a very clear and specific answer. But I am going to address the complexity uh, of industrial policy. Uh, and I suppose I'm going to be a bit critical of many of the traditional uh, 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 ideas in industrial policy, but I'm not going to come at it from a neoliberal perspective, which says that we've got to get rid of all policy because of rent-seeking behavior and we should let the market allocate resources. As you will see, I'm absolutely not in that territory, but I am in a territory which is a little skeptical of traditional industrial policy. So let's just set the tone. What do we mean by industry? Technically, of course, industry is more than manufacturing, uh, but in fact, most of us toys talk about manufacturing. And it's in that sense that I'm going to be talking about industrial policy. So just a bit of homework before we start. Why might we concern to industrialize? Well, historical experience is that the high per capita income countries are countries with uh, large shares of manufacturing in GDP. Uh, Engels law, as per capita incomes rise, people consume less and less of agricultural products. So we thought, uh, but I wonder about that more and more manufacturers. In manufacturing is labor intensive. It's an opportunity to spread the gains around the economy. The barriers to entry are high in manufacturing, and therefore you can keep competitive pressures at bay. And unlike agriculture, where the supposedly the barriers to entry are very low, where incomes are low, manufacturing or industry is an arena where you can actually protect yourself more from, com from competition, 
through technology and various other uh, proprietary assets, and therefore you can have high and sustainable incomes. Price of agricultural products and commodities falls in time compared to the price of manufacturers. Let's see. I'll show you some data to question that. Productivity growth is more rapid in manufacture than it is in agriculture. Undoubtedly, this case is true. Manufacturing a source of exports, and that's important because, Adam Smith, the greater the division of labor, the greater productivity growth. The larger the market, the more scope for, prod, uh, for specialization and productivity growth. That's one reason why you want exports. You have economies of scale in exports, and that is a source of productivity growth, so-called Verduin's law, and it releases the foreign exchange gap and provides resources for other productive sectors, infrastructure, and social expenditure. Now, that's a tableau of the arguments for industry, and I'm going to be addressing some of those in the following way. Firstly, there are a battery of instruments for industrial policy. I've just given you a range of them, protection, investment subsidies, industrial licensing, export subsidies, local content, development finance, special economic zones, and so on. But I'm going to be focused on two parts of the industrial policy arena. That's the main part of my discussion today. The first one is that structural transformation and industrialization, and I'll talk a bit about the lineage of that, is achieved by moving through the sectors, so-called normal patterns of industrial growth. And so you have Hollis Chenery, uh, Sirquin, Moshe Sirquin, Unido, flying, you know about the flying geese model, uh, and Justin Lim, formerly chief economist at the World Bank, choose a country with approximately double your per capita income, look at their sectoral uh, structure, target those sectors, and you will soon be where they were. So there's a general here with the normal patterns of industrialization that you begin with garments and furniture and shoes, and then gradually you make all your way, all the way up the tree of industry until you're making, designing and making semiconductors. So I'm going to be looking at that one. And the second part of industrial strategy I'm going to look at is, is the route to the building of incomes and capabilities to be found in import protection, that is, protecting yourself from competition. Now, as you all know, the neoliberal uh, agenda was very much against import protection, so you might find it interesting to see why I might be critical of import protection as well. With a particular focus, you remember the reasons for industrialization. I'm particularly interested in two parts of that, delivering sustainable income growth in an economy which is trading with the world. I'm not suggesting that economies are completely integrated with the world, but it's reasonably open. And secondly, I'm concerned with manufacturing industrialization, which delivers employment and inclusion. So my last slide uh, before the first end of this first segment is so-called normal patterns of industrialization. I don't know how many of you know the literature, but essentially what has happened over the years is that there have been analyses of the shares of different sectors in different countries, and in particular point in time, so you would take countries which have a per capita income of $1,000 per year, and you look at the share of different sectors there, countries with a per capita income of $5,000 a year, and look at the share of different sectors there, all the way through until $20,000, $25,000. And from that, you get a, uh, a normal pattern of industrialization. So you can see that this one here, is with just textiles. Low levels per capita income, the share of textiles in GDP will be higher. As per capita incomes grow, the share of textiles will be low. Whereas this one here with a circle through it is chemicals and chemical products. And this is a perspective which is, underlies much of industrial policy. Essentially says, look, you've just got to grow through these phases. And if you can manage this process of structural transformation, uh, you will be on your way to sustainable income growth. And you will find it in most of the standard literature on industrial policy. Go to the, what are really, really good now, the UNIDO Industrial Development Reports done every year, and you will find that that's, that's in the reports. This is from a paper to one of the Industrial Development Boards some years ago. Uh, Antonio, instead of speaking and then stopping, which will put me to sleep as well as you, I prefer to stop at various stages and take one or two questions and comments. So 
You can see where I'm going. Any questions about what we've done so far? Okay, we have a series of reasons why you might want to have industry. I'm focusing, and I didn't talk about why you want a policy intervention. We don't have the time for that. I'm looking at two parts of the classical industrial policy agenda, which is sectoral transformation and import protection, protecting your industry against imports. And I'm concerned about that because I want to see how we can create sustainable income growth on the one hand and maximize employment and inclusion on the other hand. And again, there are five assertions which are going to go through one by one. Firstly, a theoretical point, but we'll have some empirical material. Uh, you'll get a sense of what I mean as I go along. Sustainable incomes are provided by the generation and appropriation of rents. Remember I spoke about barriers to entry in the first slide. That is protecting yourself from competition. It used to be thought that manufacturing was much more protected from competition than other sectors. And I'm going to argue that that is no longer the case about manufacturing in general, although it may be the case about particular parts of manufacturing. That's the first assertion I'm going to make. Secondly, why I'm not giving you the answer is 77. Nuance is important. I'm not going to talk about one industrial policy. I'm going to talk about two or three different sets of policies. And the problem then is how you sew them all together. The third issue is around not so much industrial policy, but innovation policy, policy and focusing on the building of capabilities as opposed to sectors. Following from that, are we talking about a productive, an industri a productive sector, a productive, I'm sorry, this should be that we're on. Are we talking about industrial policies or I will talk about productive sector policies, uh, no longer privileging just industry, and finally, I want to talk about inclusive industrialization, uh, which is the story about employment and, uh, and participation and who, who industry is producing for. So that's really the heart of what I'm saying. You don't have to take it down now. I'm going to go through those one by one. Again, any questions? I'll begin with the first one. Here's the assertion. In a reasonably open economy, sustainable incomes, which after all is what industrial policy is about, that's really, you don't have industry for industry's sake. You have industry because you have sustainable and spread incomes. Sustainable incomes are provided by the generation and appropriation of rents. So what do we mean by that? There are two sources of industrial growth. The first one is extensive growth, which is doing the same thing over and over and over again. So you can actually get industry to grow by just replicating exactly the same type of factory, type of industry all over the economy. We call that extensive growth. Intensive growth is when you build new plants, you actually incorporate some level of technological change. Now, if you're in a closed economy, the first one is completely viable. You can go on growing your industry by just having the same plant built over and over and over and over again. But once you're in a competitive world, once there's technological change occurring in your sector, it's no longer feasible, almost always, there's some exceptions, it's no longer feasible to grow by just doing the same thing over and over again. You've got to have technological progress so that each time you're investing, there's some improvement, whether it be improvement in organization, whether it be some improvement in machinery, where there be some improvement in skills. In the reason me, point I've made, open economy, a reliance on extensive investment is the path to what I call immiserizing growth. And what's immiserizing growth? That is more and more economic activity with lower and lower incomes. So let me give you an example. You understand where I'm going? Good, I wish I did. Okay. So here's a factory I worked with in the Dominican Republic in the early 1990s. They had a contract, I believe it was in Levi Strauss, January 1990, making 9,000 jeans for $2.18 a jean. Nine months later, the contract was renegotiated. No longer 9,000 jeans, we'll do 5,000 jeans a month. You remember $2.18? We can't afford that anymore. We'll pay you $2.05. Four months later, or two months later, sorry, you remember the 5,000 jeans a week? 
We're only taking 3,000, we'll pay you $1.87. And 30 months after the arrangement was started, the factory was closed down immediately. Why? Because, is, how many people in this room are not economists? Okay. Robert, don't lie. Okay. So, uh, what happened was, the World Bank and the IMF went to all the countries in the region and said, you know, Nicaragua, your wages are a bit high. We think you ought to devalue. So, Nicaragua devalues, and the dollar cost of its wages falls, and then the fallacy of composition, the World Bank, the IMF, go around to Costa Rica and say, look at Nicaragua's wages out there. Pretty low, aren't they? You're not competitive, you better devalue. So Nicaragua developed. And they went to Mexico and said, look at Costa Rica and Nicaragua. Your wages are too high, you better devalue. So what was happening is that these firms were located in economies where the macroeconomic strategy was not around building capabilities, it was solely around the dollar cost of wages. So their only way of competing was to reduce their real standard of living, which is in miserizing growth. We found a factory in the Dominican Republic which was assembling shoes. Everything was imported in the shoes that were being assembled, absolutely everything. The unit value area of those shoes was 22 US cents. It wasn't producing shoes at all. It had a footwear sector but actually, it wasn't manufacturing shoes. It was taking things out of boxes which had been imported, putting them in front of machines and just sewing them together, putting them, wrapping them in paper which was imported, putting them in box which were imported, shipping them out again. There was no value added there, either in the firm itself or in the economy as a whole. So here we see a strategy of industrialization, which is essentially a race to the bottom. And those economies in, uh, in, the, in, the North, in Central America were not unique. This, when China entered the world economy with cheap labor in the late 1980s, and then when Eastern Europe entered the world economy, the global labor force doubled overnight. And the consequence was that manufacturing, which had always seen an increase in the prices of manufacturers because there were barriers to entry, Manufacturing, for the first time in living memory for many people, saw a decline in its relative prices. And it wasn't the relative prices of all manufacturers. The percentage, this is a study I did many years ago, of the likelihood of prices falling of products imported into Europe. You can see that the likelihood of prices falling in the context of that previous graph was greater in low technology products, then in resource based products, and of course, the higher up the technological spectrum we went, the lower the fall in unit prices. So that that historical assertion that manufacturing had high barriers to entry and was the source of sustainable incomes is open to question. It was historically true, but with, and you'll start, talk about the advance of global value chains in the next set of discussion, when manufacturing began to be sliced up and spread around the world in ways which I'll talk about, it was no longer evident that manufacturing was benefiting across the board from barriers to entry. We can talk about that a bit later on. So, I'm going to move on to the second assertion. The first assertion is that sustainable income growth is no longer necessarily provided by the manufacturing sector. Manufacturing is a much more complex phenomenon than we used to see. Any questions? I was just interested to know um, how the trend has taken place over the last 15 years. Has it been a continued decline or has there been any change in increasing awareness of these kind of problems? Well, terms of trade, as you know, turned against manufacturers between 2001 and 2014 because of the commodities boom. And no question about that. Now commodity prices have fallen, and everybody's talking about the end of the terms of trade reversal, but manufacturing prices are falling as well. Read the Financial Times, look at the articles which are streaming out about overcapacity in many manufacturing sectors, what's happening to the price of manufacturers and capital goods in China 
and in other countries. So I wouldn't say the terms of trade are no longer against manufacturing, but we see a continued progression of falling price in many parts of manufacturing. Okay. So assertion number two, nuance is important. Is this true across all of the manufacturing industry? And why is it that we have these circumstances in which the historical uh, progression of high manufacturer prices was interrupted? And for that, I'm afraid, <laughs> would you surprise, be surprised if I said I was going to speak about global value chains? We have to understand the nature of global value chains. I guess most of you know about value chains, do you? You know that it's made up of a series of activities. What happened was that over time, China, Dominican Republic, all those countries which were good at the physical transformation of products, entered this domain which was historically the domain of the rich countries and forced down the production. And so we had production moving from physical manufacture to the disembodied, the knowledge intensive parts of design and the selling. And so we get a phenomenon which is seen to be deindustrialization in the North. But actually that's a misnomer. Because in the world of 20 years ago, these parts were part of here. What's happened now is that the transnationals of this world have said, we don't want to do that anymore. That's now easy. So things which were formerly in manufacturing are now in the service sector. I live in the south coast near a place called Worthing. The premium, or one of the premium world design studios for automobiles is in Worthing. It used to be part of Leyland Automobile Corporation, Rover Automobile Corporation. It used to be manufacturing. It's no longer manufacturing. It's now in the service sector. So with this breaking open of global value chains, many of the physical manufacturing parts of that chain have been shipped out, stripped out of their skills, although many developing countries have high levels of skill, stripped out of their knowledge intensity, although many developing countries do have high levels of knowledge intensity, and the advanced com companies say we're not interested. Well, why should we do something which everybody else can do? We're going to concentrate on what they call their core competences. We're going to do the things that nobody else can do. It's called specialization and the division of labor. So the advance of global value change is really underlying that story which I've been telling in the previous assertion, which is the shipping out of things which were formerly manufacturing, which are relatively easy, which have low barriers of entry, opening that up to competition, and the value-added activities are now increasingly centered in the rich countries and now also in some of the, the low- and middle-income countries as well. Now, with this in mind, I'm going to talk about two different types of value chains because they have different industrial policy consequences. You remember the point I'm making in this assertion that we need a nuanced and a variegated approach to industrial policy. And I want to show you how, depending on which type of global value chain you're in, the policy implications will be rather different. Bearing in mind that our overall objective is sustainable income growth and spreading the gains from, from industrial growth. Of course, we're getting competitive pressures in the service sector as well. So I'm going to talk about two value chains, what I call additive value chains and what I call uh, vertically specialized value chains. What are additive value chains? You'll recognize that, right? So for you even might recognize it. Sorry which is the cocoa industry. You can see this is something which necessarily happens in sequence. You can't make cocoa liquor without first growing the beans, or without first grinding the beans, or whatever. So these are predominantly in the resource sector. They are chains where the different parts of that production chain cannot be done in parallel. I'll, I'll give you an example of parallel processing just now. They are necessarily additive in nature. And you'll find this right through, right through the commodity sector in virtually all commodities. And some manufacturing firms choose to do it this way as well, but I don't have the time to talk about that. Vertically specialized chains are rather different. Anyone on iPhone 4? Okay. 
Sold in America for $495. You know the story, everybody? Sold in America for $495. Exported from China, $175. What was the value added in China for that iPhone? Those phones weren't made in China. In fact, if you go to your iPhone and you look at the back, it doesn't say made in China. It says assembled in China. In fact, these phones were made in China with components brought in from all over the world. The different parts of the iPhone manufacturer were done in parallel. They can be done anywhere. They can be shipped easily. And much of contemporary manufacturing, the clothing story I told you from Dominican Republic and other things, is essentially a story uh, of this type of manufacturer. So, if we, oops. oh, I went up. Okay, so if you look globally, more than two thirds of global trade is now in value chains. Okay, of that, the vertically specialized value chains comprise about seventy-five percent of world trade but only 25% of Africa's trade and Latin America, incidentally. The additive, the resource sectors, dominate in Africa, but they only account for 25% of global value chains. So let me simplify what looks like being unnecessarily complicated. We've got increasingly production being broken up and sent around the world. Well, the question we ask is, do we have the same industrial policy for, for different chains? And I'm saying, you have to distinguish the industrial policy in the additive chains from the industrial policy in, in, the, in the vertically specialized chains. The vertically specialized chains are 75% of world trade. Now, this is where we begin to run up against so-called industrial policy. In the vertically specialized trade, you want to de-industrialize. See, that's the traditional industrial policy. You slowly build your capabilities. Once you get into these global value chains, you say, you know, there are many parts of that which other people can do better than I am. I'm going to give things up if I was producing them in the past. And if I wasn't producing them in the past, it's not going to be my ambition to be everything. I'm just going to do narrow segments of those chains. And we go back to the question now about normal patterns of industrialization because it's not positioning between sectors which becomes important. It's what position you're going to have within a particular sector. I'll come back to this later on. Seventy-five percent, or seventy-two thirds of all world trade, is within value chains. If you want to, I'll tell you what the definition of that is. So, two thirds of all world trade—is that what I said? Yeah. Uh, of all trade is in global value is in global value chains. Two thirds. Very important because if you look at my phone, that screen is counted twice in world trade. It's an export from Korea to, to, to China, counted as Korea's exports to China. And it's counted as part of China's exports to the rest of the world. So 28%, 30% of total world trade is counted twice. So the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the IMF are all in a quandary. What do trade statistics mean when we say that a country has exports of whatever it is? Because many of those exports are almost entirely imported as well. So two-thirds of world trade are in global value chains. Of that two-thirds of world trade, 75% are in the vertically specialized trains. And the industrial policy in the vertical specialized chains runs against that core agenda in industrial policy, which is to choose a sector and to deepen your industrial activity. Very powerful point, if you accept it. it runs against one of the central tenets 
of traditional industrial policy. Now, that's not the case for the additive value chain. The additive value chains in the resource sector is all around linkages. Hirschman said one thing leads to another in the resource sector. You can use the resource sector by building linkages vertical to suppliers, or, uh, oh, sorry, vertical forward or backward to suppliers, uh, over here to suppliers or to users, or horizontal linkages. I won't bore you with the difference. In these additive value chains, you actually have a process where the share of value added in these chains goes up over time. And here, industrial policy is to speed up the share of domestic linkages, and if you can, to move it into the core competences, I'm jumping various bits of discussion, I'm afraid we don't have time, in moving to the areas which the transnational is already strong in, and if you screw it up, you can do wrong. But can you see the point I'm making about the, the uh, additive value chain? Is that this is a very different industrial strategy. In the additive value chains, it looks much more like traditional industrial policy. You may want to protect the inputs and produce your inputs locally. You may want to uh, export, uh, subsidize exports. Indonesia does that. You may want to target your infrastructure for these sectors. You may want to target your national systems of innovation around particular sectors. So these are the sorts of instruments in traditional industrial policy. And what I'm saying is that for that part of production, which has also world markets in the place, this is a traditional industrial policy has considerable relevance. Only, only a quarter of world global value-added chains is in this territory. For the three quarters that is not, you don't want to follow this agenda. You want to follow a different agenda. And that's where I want to move on to my next assertion. So can I round up the point I was making? If you want sustainable income growth, you've got to do things that other people can't do. Historically, that was manufacturing. When the big corporations in the world understood in the 1980s, it's called around specialization in core competences, that actually they could get a lot of things go. A lot of the traditional manufacturing no longer was very attractive. You could get it done cheaper in China. Hang on to the knowledge creation parts of that story. They then shipped it out, and we had this competitive process where countries were competing against each other through devaluation, through lowering wages, and we had this massive dispersion of manufacturing capability around the world. That was the first point I made about rents and barriers to entry. The second point I'm saying is that in some parts of the export sector, this means that you no longer, you no longer want to encourage industrial transformation as a deepening of your presence in a particular sector. You may want to target very, very narrow niches of that sector, very narrow niches, and just do that part of the story. If you're in the commodity sector, you might want to do the traditional, the traditional thing and deepen, commit yourself to a sector and deepen it in your sector. So I'm going to go into my third assertion. Any questions here? Like, sorry. Steel. So who in their right mind would make steel now? There's massive overcapacity. Don't make steel. No, Think I'm about... I'm just using that as, as an example. That's an, an example of, of your attitude. Right? Commodity. The commodity world. Okay. It's the same the old-fashioned industrial policy people that kind of um, commodity uh, value chain. But I'm saying old-fashioned industrial policy was never used for that kind of value chain. So, one way into the steel industry is to deepen your presence and move into 
the primary inputs into the steel industry, the equipment to make the steel itself, to make the special steels and the products that make from steel. South Africa, for example, talks about beneficiation. We've got the raw materials, do everything. The other thing is to say, the physical transformation of iron ore into steel, let the Chinese do it. What we'll do is we'll have the knowledge to make special steels. We'll sell the knowledge for the capital equipment. We will move out of that part of the chain, which is the relatively easy thing to do. I don't know whether I've quite captured your point, but I would say that's an example of where a modern industrial policy may want to say, I don't want to make steel anymore. I want to be elsewhere in that chain. Thinking of that chain not just in making steel, but all the way from the knowledge and inputs which go into that steel making into the transformation and use of it. Any other questions? Yeah. to come to that later on. Remember, the, the agrarian story is a story of commodities and linkages, but the idea of agriculture being a low technology and an undifferentiated product compared to manufacturing, which is high technology and differentiated, that's another thing that's gone. So Carlotta Perez, does not name anything to anybody here? Very influential Venezuelan theorist, believes that it's in the differentiation of commodities that the Latin American contact, uh, uh, continent has real possibilities. I only partly captured your question, I'll come to other parts later on. Any other questions? Okay. So that doesn't mean that there are no parts of manufacturing which have barriers to entry or worth doing. German economy is a very good example. And there's a very famous book of the 1980s called The Second Industrial Divide, which said that the mass production manufacturing would go to developing countries, but the niche-based, what they call flexible specialization manufacturing, would stay in the rich countries. So your point's absolutely right. I'm making a crude point because I want to tell you a whole story. But of course, if this is all what we're talking about, we'd pick up your point. I would like to say also, you know the distinction between positive analysis and normative analysis. I'm telling you a story of what I think has happened and why it's happening. I'm not telling you a story of what I think I would like to happen. And I think that's a completely different agenda. You know, what ought we to be doing for a more sane and sensible world in the context of ecological and environmental stress uh, and a globalization superstructure which is collapsing, is a completely different story. But I don't want to go there now. That's the next lecture. Okay. We've had two assertions so far. The, the, the following three are not so long. You'll be relieved to know. So, policies for innovation are no longer around sectors, but they're around, they're around particular capabilities. So, companies and countries are no longer, this is the central part of the GBC story in the flexible uh, in the vertically specialized region. They're no longer exporting products, they are exporting capabilities within products. It's a major, major conclusion which is coming out of research. So China's iPhone is not exporting iPhones, it's exporting assembly expertise. The Dominican Republic 
uh, sewing machine people are no longer exporting shoes. They never were exporting shoes. The British automobile industry, which is now thriving, no longer exports motor cars in the sense that 60% of all the components are imported. Its capabilities are logistics capabilities, design capabilities, branding capabilities. And this is the major story which comes out of uh, much of the contemporary thinking about innovation and industrialization is what does it mean to say that you should specialize in capabilities rather than in sectors and products. So here's my story of Samsung. Uh, I'm going to go about it a, uh, a little, in a little complicated way, short circuiting. You see the top line, process, product, functional, chain upgrading. The traditional innovation story has been around process and product. What the value chain analysis does is it says we have to think of innovation not just being around the way things are produced or the design of the products. We have to think about the organizational coordination of all of this. So this is the idea of governance in global value chains and of, do you know about Lin Fung? Anybody know about Lin Fung? When Nike and Levi Strauss and various companies export, oh, um, uh, have their clothes sourced from developing countries, they don't do the sourcing themselves. They go to a company called Li and Fung in Hong Kong, and Levi Strauss will say, we want jeans, this is the design we want, that's what we'll pay you for it. You do it, your job. Foxconn, although Apple started manufacturing phones in the, uh, in the USA for various reasons, Apple doesn't, doesn't really care about Foxconn unless there are bad labor conditions or disaster. He goes to Foxconn and says, this is what I want, right, do it for me. So this is what we call functional upgrading, changing what you're doing in the chain. And Samsung and the Korean companies began by assembling, like the Dominican Republic story. They then went into manufacturing, transforming. They then said, let's do our own design, and let's do our own brand. But after a while in Taiwan, they just went out of these things. Robert knows about this. And they moved into completely different areas. Now, the literature on innovation says that almost all sectors, that tends to take about 30 or 40 years. You can't, and it's important because you've all heard of Danny Roderick <coughs> and Ricardo Hausman, because for them, sorry, can I go back a slide? Uh, you see, the interesting thing is this part of the story. As you move into these more complex forms of upgrading. So you do less and less of the physical things, which is what we call manufacturing, and more and more of the knowledge content. And Antonio is absolutely right. You will still do some of the physical things. But in general, the dirty, the manufacturing, are things which you ship out to somebody else. The knowledge content goes up. So capabilities is what is now exercising the macroeconomists, because firms are no longer trading in products, countries are no longer trading in products, they're trading in capabilities. What the hell do we mean by it, right? The Hausman, everybody, does anybody know the Danny Roderick, Ricardo Hausman story of monkeys and trees? So you have certain sectors which are close to each other, where countries which export one thing tend to export things around them. And that is essentially a story of capabilities. You develop a capability in assembling iPhones, you can use that to assemble something else. You develop a, a, a competence in design, flair of design for clothes, you can extend that to flair of design for furniture or flair of design for shoes. And so some part of this industrial policy agenda is around capabilities, is trying to identify what these trees are, the adjacent uh, policies, and you get monkeys which jump across and the innovation people are saying, come on, <laughs> this takes 30 or 40 years. There's path dependency. It's not nearly as easy to take your capabilities from one sector to another sector. So I'm just thinking what part of this debate is about. And moreover, this is the critical point, capabilities are dynamic. They change very rapidly. So to round off my third assertion, 
that it is that your policy now is no longer around sectors in this vertically specialized chains. It's around finding which niche you are in those sectors, which are the areas which are relatively protected from competition, and what are the capabilities I develop in those sectors, how can I move them on. So one of the things, for example, I'm doing is I'm working on offshore wind farms in Sussex. How do we deepen the value added of British firms? And E.ON, which is a German firm, has contracted a British systems integrator to say, fix the problem for me. And they say, well, we need submersible apparatus under the water to see what's happening to uh, the feet of these pylons. Who knows something about autonomous vehicles in Britain? They need know nothing about the sea at all. That's a separate issue. But they have a capabilities in remote controlled autonomous transfer. And so what E.ON is trying to do is to harness those capabilities which are in autonomous guided remote mechanisms to the capabilities in underwater, underwater poles. So my assertion three is essentially, sorry, yeah. transition from process to product to functional to chain upgrading. I had the transition from assembly to manufacture to design to branding. Do you necessarily have to go through that sequence? Or can you jump? Or can you do them together? In principle, of course, you can jump, you can do them together, and it depends upon the sector. But in general, and that's the desirable thing, to go in at the higher many Chinese firms have that ambition. Whether it's possible, to the extent it's possible, is an interesting story. For example, IKEA, wonderful flat pack design which transformed the world furniture industry. IKEA keeps a factory in Sweden making furniture. It says, unless I know how to make furniture, I won't be able to design it appropriately and to get my logistics of this value chain globally going. But you're absolutely right. To the extent that the rents are in the functional part of that story. Yeah, if you can get there, go there. Very difficult. But in principle, your point's absolutely right. Okay, yep. I've got a wonderful slide from Alice in Wonder and it's through the looking glass where Alice and the Red Queen go running and they run and they do you know the do you know the example very famous example they go running 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 and eventually Alice sits down and says the whole time we're in exactly the same tree where I started running from and I've been working the whole time I come up and got anywhere else and the Red Queen says oh no in our sort of country somewhere else you could have run at least twice as fast as that. Because we're in a world of rapid change. So developing a capability at any one point in time, that's not the capability. What you want to develop is the capacity to develop capacities and capabilities. So you asked a complex question, and I'm really trying to hang in there and saying what appears to be a niche, a profitable niche at the moment, will no longer be a profitable niche. So you know the story of float glass, of Pilkington glass? Look through the window, it's completely clear, isn't it? 
Anybody been into old houses and when you look through the window, it's not quite clear to look through it. Anybody just recognize anybody? How was glass made? Glass used to be made by just throwing molten glass onto a liquid surface of water. And the man who the book called Pilkington was doing the, what they say about men, uh, was doing the washing up. Uh, his wife had got him to do it. And he put the washing up liquid in the water, in the sink. There's a lot of fat in the water. And he noticed the transformation. All the fat went to the top of the water. Why didn't we make glass that way? So they then started floating glass on something I think it had a mercury content, I don't remember, but essentially had the same effect as oil. And for 25 years, it was had the world's patent. It's called float glass. Its factory in Britain and its head office in Britain was as luxurious as you can get it. It was the Microsoft and Google building of the 1970s. Now bankrupt. Because once its patent expired and its protection had gone, everybody could copy it. So it's around this ability to change the whole time their capabilities are growing. I mustn't get lost. Okay. So therefore, when you think about the chain, you no longer think about a particular industry. You think about the whole chain. And very often those chains will, will, uh, are no longer restricted to manufacture. Sorry, first point. We're not just talking about a manufacturing story, your agricultural story. There are many agricultural products where these barriers to entry and niches are to be found. But, and agricultural and services also present, possess rent-intensive activities. But very often, systemic efficiency in value chains necessitates crossing sectoral boundaries. So I'm just involved in finish writing the uh, Economic Commission for Africa's report on green industrialization. This year, the annual report of the ECA is on green industrialization. And the battle we've had with the African ministers is that stop thinking about industry. If you want to green your growth, you can't confine it just to the manufacturing industrial parts of the story. You've got to look about the whole chain through agriculture, servicing, and manufacturing as well. The organization of the Karolinska Hospital in Sweden, very famous story, learned from the lesson of Toyota's manufacturing activities. So the very important lesson I draw from this is it's not possible in a chain context to be effective in one part of the chain without having the capability to span the whole chain. And therefore we must no longer think about industrial policy we must think about productive sector policy, which cuts across services, manufacturing, and agriculture. Think of the story of that design house in the south coast I told you about making motor cars. And think of the, the British motor car industry. For Britain to have a value-adding presence in motor cars, it has to have capabilities in physical transformation, in the design of cars, in the branding of cars as well. It has to span across sectors. It's no longer confined to industry alone. Okay, last point, and then I'll be finished. Yeah, any points in the last one, which I'm rushing now? Okay. No longer just around industrial policy, it's around productive sector policy. Yes. But it may be that there are parts of finance which are part of this as well. Much of finance is predatory, but finance also has a role to play in some parts of production. It seems to me that it's not just industrial policy, it has to be the whole concept of industrialization itself. I mean, it says that virtually the only thing for the protect. And you're building something to the national economy and transforming it globally. That's categorically not true. As a national policy maker, you cannot really set out to industrialize. So that's right, that's the central logic. The logic of industrialization, the very first slide was about
services and agriculture give as many opportunities as manufacturing. Or it may be that you need to have capabilities which span across these things, which is the second order. But I want to add one final point which is different to all this. And I'm going to stop for three minutes, just uh, three minutes, two minutes, just to get a break because I'm going to talk about things which are rather different now, which is the issue of inclusive growth and the role of manufacturing and industry within that. I do know what I'm going to say, uh, but I'm going to talk about rather different order of things. So what's the problem? We have massive unemployment all around the world. We're producing things for a very narrow group of people around the world. We're not meeting the needs of poor consumers or poor people. We're screwing up the environment. So we have to think beyond the narrow parts of how to be successful in the global economy, which is what I've done until now. We have to ask ourselves the question about the meaning of development. Have we got the whole story right? Is this really what growth, industrialization, and the manufacturing should all be about? Or do we have to think about what we want to get out of the story in a very different way? And here I'm moving into the normative sides of that. And this is the discussion around inclusive growth. Almost none of the things I've been speaking about so far, except for the narrow question of employment, address that. And yet, the industrial sector, the manufacturing sector, is producing things for people to use to a greater, lesser extent, including people in the production process and having an impact on the environment. So the challenge now when we're thinking about industrial policy, I'd like to call productive sector policy, is to think about it in a rather different frame, which I'll call inclusive industrialization. So... Income distribution is an important part of industrial orientation. I was in Cuba last year, and I was just so overwhelmingly impressed by the Cuban investment in the meeting of health needs. Cuba has a higher life expectancy than the USA, and it's better on almost every single health indicator than the USA outcome. We went to the research center in Cuba, which is developing really globally innovative solutions to things like diabetes, to skin cancer, and a variety of other things. We walked in, we had the presentation, the guy stands up, he says, great, head of the research center, dressed in jeans, t-shirt. He says, I want you to understand, I was there with a group of, the, the World Innovation Research Community has annual conferences all around the world. Last year we were in Cuba, so he was talking to a group of specialists in innovation. He said, we never think about profit when we produce pharmaceuticals or when we get our health sector. You must understand that. We start off with mobility, what the population needs, and we solve that problem. We don't ask the question about what is going to generate a profit for us. And here you have a country with a low per capita income, with these wonderful health outcomes, because it's, look, there are lots of problems with Cuba, right? There's also a lot of rubbish in what he was saying because there are problems in what he's doing as well, but leave that aside for the moment. Basically, we have a system which is producing things for people's needs. And it's located in a political system and a pattern of income distribution which is rather different to that which induces, the word innovation scholars use, which induces innovations uh, in other contexts. So we have to be concerned with inclusive innovation. Different types of innovation processes, more people being employed. For example, we tax labor, but we don't tax the environment. Is it surprising, therefore, that we're getting manufacturing technologies which are labor intensive and which screw up the environment? Do we need a different set of incentives out there which will redirect the nature of process technologies? What sorts of products are we producing? I've given you the example of the Cuban pharmaceuticals. Uh, and I want to just briefly talk about some work which I'm just writing up at the moment. We've been looking at uh, the use of Chinese equipment in East Africa. And the innovation milieu in China is 
very different to the northern countries. The technologies which are coming from China to Africa are distinctively different. Because they're produced in a different macroeconomic and political framework and have very different operating characteristics. And this is very important. The share of China, capital goods, everybody know what I mean? Machinery and equipment. The share of China in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America's imports of capital goods. Should I say that again? Total imports of capital goods. Share of China in Africa, Asia, Latin America's capital goods has risen from 2% in 2000 to 28 to 30% in 2015. There is a massive transformation occurring under the radar which has to do with the nature of technologies involved in manufacturing, and which ultimately is a story of innovation. So it's no longer the case that appropriate technologies are inefficient, and that it's the traditional manufacturing technologies from the north which are optimal in developing countries, either for reasons of private profit or for reasons of development outcomes. And this and other things really need us to think about growth within which is manufacturing innovation, uh, industrialization, in a broader and different macroeconomic framework, and to make that part of the story, inclusive growth, really the driver, talking normatively now, of our policy agenda, which is no longer an agenda just of industrial policy, but also innovation policy. So back to the beginning. The primary choice may no longer involve repositioning, may now involve repositioning within sectors rather than marching through the sectors. Industrial policy is outdated. We need to think, yeah, have a holistic, cross sectoral, productive sector policy. Too much. I apologize. I rushed a bit at the end. Can I just tell you, before I left Sussex, I got an award for innovative teaching. Because after the lecture, I would walk around the room.
states with this one that you have to locate industrial policy, in this case, increasing growth, in the wider frame. You screwed me, is that right? No, no, I think it's getting too wide. It would be stifled issues of growth in any case. Yeah. yeah. Political economy is not the problem. Okay, well, I want to um, go on with the point you just made. <coughs> There's a separate question in what you said, which I thought you were going to ask, which is what's the limit to national sovereignty? Yeah. And country, but that's a separate, we've had that discussion before. So what are the objects? I think China and India are large enough to be worlds on their own. And I think that they can, if they are not subject to the same fractures of financialization as the North, which is beginning to emerge in China, subject to that, I think China and India can sustain Small countries like Costa Rica, highly poor small countries, can get there as well. I think for the bulk of other countries, my own country, South Africa, Brazil, and other countries, I think there's indeed a lot of Do you have a view on that? Um, yeah. I think that's probably right. One there, one there, please. Uh, in
these capital goods which we're writing at the moment. Because then they're not bad. These are market relationships. The tractors are part of the government structure. But we're talking about African cable to China and airplane and buying things in markets and bringing them back. This is almost like I think you also gave an answer about the machine tool story, right? You said there's an economic story, and I have to mention Rosenberg, right? Because yeah, 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 Rosenberg documented the fact that after the Second World War, only three, four countries were able to produce and export machine tools, right? If you look at the same, I've been tracking the information about you know, who is producing machine tools and exporting them. Now, at the moment, the US was one of the countries who was able to produce machine tools at that time. Now it's importing as a deficit of machine tools, right? So you have certain type of production technologies that in a sense seems to be good indicators of where the production capacity is really going. One of the countries were developing this competitive advantage. So, you know, other things of this are here. So, this is an interesting story, both normatively, what sort of world we want to live in, and also the possibilities. Of this. Southeast Asia. Yeah, Southeast Asia. All of them. What about uh, the Chinese share? 
No, William, uh, that is uh, William Charles. Uh, they believe uh, that you give sustainable income to the group by
the story of the trading capital is, and you begin to get a trajectory to accumulation, which is rather driven when the world is pulled by the south, compared to when it's pulled by the north. There's another story for you to talk about. What happens when the engine of growth is the south? Uh, two things. One is a thought exercise. I'm taking your idea for a longer time horizon. Are we at um, the assumption that Paris, the capability 
much through. And I, I, I hope that the centrality of the industrial policy gets to this very close. It's a complex story. We have to think across sectors. We're talking productive sector, no longer industrial policy. And in some cases, the one thing the system would only run against at least two components of industrial policy, which is moving between the sectors, because moving within the sectors may be more important. And second, you may want to actually free up your trade and fill out rather than to close it down. Thanks, Dr. and we are going to have a Jun Chang and other colleagues who have been working on a report on industrial policy, and smart industrial policy in Africa. So they're all welcome to